Hopefully, none of you were like me as a teenager. When I was a teenager, I took every opportunity to skip class that I could. Anybody else in that sort of bracket? Oh, yes, yes, a few others, yes. <laughs> oh, yeah, my wife's like, no, I never did that. In fact, uh, we the teachers, it was really terrible because... Um, the teachers actually nicknamed my group of friends the Bicycle Gang because we used to skip classes and get on our bikes and take off places. And uh, anyway, of course, parents found out and of course we got in trouble, as we should. And I uh, just want to make clear, if there's any youth in our room this morning, that you should not skip classes, okay? Just to uh, reinforce that for the parents. Anyway, what that, what that actually exposes is a desire for us to get out of things. And I, and I think for all of us, we can kind of relate that there are things that come in life where we'd just like to get out of it. Maybe it's a responsibility. Maybe it's an obligation. You know, it would be just so good if somebody else could do that for me. But what that actually reveals is that in all of us, we, we have this struggle to actually not be faithful. And this morning, as we dive into 2 Timothy to, to listen to what Paul has to, to say to Timothy and then listen to what God has to say to us as a church, we need to realize that there's this great temptation in, in terms of guarding faith, guarding what God has entrusted to us, to not be faithful. And, and, and Paul is greatly burdened by this as he's writing to Timothy. And the whole book, 2 Timothy especially, is that he is entrusting, he is pleading, he is reminding, he is forcing Timothy to really come to terms about what it looks like to be a pastor in a church, in the church of Ephesus, and, and to see the people of God move in the direction that God has called us to move in. And he's actually wanting all of us to be faithful in our promise and in our claim to follow Jesus. And just like I said, skipping class doesn't make you a faithful student. It actually affects your marks. And in my case, the, the vice principal was chasing me down. Chris, you missed another class. Well, hopefully that we, today, as we go over what Paul is saying to Timothy, and again, what God is saying to us, that we can actually reflect and say, you know what, I'm being faithful. I'm being faithful to what God has called me to. So let's read in uh, 2 Timothy chapter 4. Many of you have already turned there, but it's uh, verses 1 through to 8. And this is, and he's getting ready to wind up the letter. So this is like he's putting down the last few things that he wants to say that are of great importance. He says this, I charge you in the presence of God and of Christ Jesus who is to judge the living and the dead, and by his appearing and his kingdom, preach the word. Be ready in season and out of season. Reprove, rebuke, and exhort with complete patience and teaching. For the time is coming when people will not endure sound teaching. But having itching ears, they will accumulate for themselves teachers to suit their own passions, and will turn away from listening to the truth and wander into myths. As for you, always be sober-minded, endure suffering, do the work of an evangelist, fulfill your ministry. For I am already being poured out as a drink offering, and the time of my departure has come. I have fought the good fight. I have finished the race. I have kept the faith. Henceforth, there is laid up for me the crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will award to me on that day. And not only to me, but also to all who have loved his appearing. Paul, as he's writing to Timothy these last few words, really 
lays down for us what it actually means to be faithful with our faith. And all of us need this reminder. We all need this reminder of actually what it looks like to be faithful to God in the promises that we have made to God. Promises like, God, I, I choose to follow you and not follow other things. I choose to believe and to trust you over trusting myself. And all of this discussion that we've been having about Timothy is about us guarding our faith. And how we guard faith together is that we actually be faithful. So here's the first thing that we want to reflect on this morning in terms of faithfulness, and that is to fulfill your ministry. It's how we are faithful to our faith. And that is just to fulfill your ministry. Now as Timothy is receiving this charge from Paul, Paul gets very specific to Timothy. But it's a, 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 it applies to all of us. Because every single one of us, it doesn't matter who you are, If you have the Spirit of God inside of you because you've accepted the message of Jesus, the Holy Spirit has come to dwell inside of you. And when that Holy Spirit came to dwell inside of you, it brought with it gifts. Gifts of the Spirit. And you using those gifts is your ministry. And as Paul is writing to Timothy in verse 5, he says, As for you, he gets very specific. Always be sober-minded, endure suffering, do the work of an evangelist, fulfill your ministry. And this is so relevant to us. Because here's, here's the problem. If only a few people are fulfilling their ministry, faith being guarded or faith actually bringing a faithfulness to it is just not going to happen. There must be a fulfillment of ministry of every single believer in the body of Christ. So for Timothy, let's talk about this for a minute for Timothy because this is actually really important. So for Timothy, it was preaching and teaching. He's called to teach. He's called to correct. And then he's called to reteach. And that's the cycle of every preacher, every pastor, every elder. That they teach, they correct, and they reteach. That's all that they do. They teach, they correct, and they reteach. And you as members of the congregation, as, as people that don't have that ministry, you actually need to hold those teachers to account for that very thing. Now, why is this actually an issue? Well, Paul points this out as he says in verse 2, preach the word. you got to be ready in season and out of season to reprove and to rebuke and to exhort with complete patience and teaching. You see, there's these qualities or characteristics that come with the skill or the ability to teach and preach. That is also a part of the fulfillment of, Paul, of, of Timothy's ministry. It doesn't say here you can do it with a heavy handedness. It says to do this in a way that is sober minded, that is patient. Willing to come alongside people who need to be corrected and continue to teach them. So that's, that's how it needs to happen. But he also talks about there's, a, there's an environment where people will not endure sound teaching. And in, 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 the, in the verse here, it says it's coming. It's futuristic. Well, I would like to make the suggestion this morning that it's no longer futuristic. It's here. Okay? It's totally here. 
especially in Canada, where it says that they will accumulate teachers to suit their own passions and to turn away from listening to truth and listening to myths. Now, this is actually really important for you to understand as a member that is being taught to. And this is part of the fulfillment of ministry of the role of a teacher or of an elder or preacher. And you need to know what that is, and that's why Paul gets specific here and why God in His Word, remember we talked last week about it's, all of this is coming from God through humans to us, is because this is really important. I want to go over with you some false teachings that are in the church. Here's the first one. And this comes out in different places in different ways. Every Christian can and should speak in tongues and needs to in order to be saved. That is wrong. Okay? That's just wrong. But yet, there are places where people gather and accumulate for themselves teachers that will itch their itching ears. And there are people that are underneath that misunderstanding of what the Scriptures actually teach. Every Christian can and should speak in tongues and needs to in order to be saved. No. Salvation is not about works. And in fact, it actually says in Corinthians, do all speak with tongues? And the answer to that question is no. But yet some people are looking for an experience and they justify that experience that way. Here's another one. Christians can lose their salvation. And sometimes we hear teaching because it's so much applicational or it's so much about how we need to be living in this holy lifestyle that we begin to think that if we're not perfect before God, we will lose our salvation. Now, that's not true. When God's grip has gripped you and He is in, in charge of your heart, you can't lose your salvation. Once saved, always saved. But yet, there are people that want to itch their ears with that teaching. And, I, I, and I'll explain why in a minute. Okay, Here's one, and this one's like huge right now uh, in Canada around us. It is God's will that every Christian is to be healthy and wealthy. It's a prosperity gospel. That's what that is. That is wrong. That is wrong. Thank you. Thank you. I'm not a Christian, by the way, because I'm not healthy and I'm not wealthy. <laughs> if this were to hold true. But there are all kinds of things on the internet. There are all kinds of things on Facebook that really push this. This is the biggest doctrinal error that they have over in Africa. It's a major issue because they, there are so many poor people. And there again, there are people out there that want their ears itched with these silly things. Things that are not sound as it comes by the Word of God. Here's another one, and, and I have to say, this showed up in our midst a few years ago, and it's not here anymore. And it's just this. Christians can claim, decree, or speak something into existence. No. It's called blab it and grab it. Well, I claim that Jesus wants me to have this big new car. No. But sometimes we spiritualize that. Well, God wants me, we decree that God is going to bring many souls to Himself. Well, that'd be great. That would be awesome. But you know what? It just might not happen that way. God is sovereign. It's a misunderstanding of the sovereignty of God and who God is as He moves and acts in this time in history. But yet there are people 
who gather teachers around them that continue to teach that. Why? Because it's connected to emotionalism. It's connected to making us feel good about ourselves. It's putting us on the throne instead of God on the throne. Here's another one. And again, this one is sort of connected to a lot of them. It's this idea that following a lot of rules and regulations and following them closely will please God. It's called legalism. And again, people heap up teachers to listen to, whether it's on the internet or whether it's in churches, to build them up so that they feel good about themselves, never really coming to terms with the fact that they are sinners under the wrath of God. And we need to know that you can't please God by your works. You can only... Be pleasing to Him by faith. And faith is a gift that God gives to those that have put their faith in Him. Here's another one. Hyper grace. And this is the idea that because we're saved, we can do whatever we want and God's just okay with it. No. But people heap up to themselves. People that will, teachers that will reaffirm to them, how, how awesome they are, how morally upright they are, but yet they don't have to do what God actually commands. And those are people that just live two different sets of lives from Sunday to Monday. And then th- here's another one that I think that is really huge in our world right now, especially in the church. Hell is not real. And God is too good, He's too loving to send anyone to hell. That's so wrong. And in fact, I think for many of the church people that are in Canada, we've sort of really drifted over into this whole area of believing that there's no big deal with hell. (laughs) No, okay? We should be shaking in our boots. And when we start looking around and really realize that what we believe as Christians is that there is a place. There is a place called hell that brings people under condemnation and judgment and wrath of God. And as we look out in our neighborhoods, as we drive down our streets, those are the things that we need to be thinking about. But if we've been heaping up teachers for ourselves that don't teach that hell is a real place, and that people are going to go to hell then the urgency of the gospel is just like, well, I guess it doesn't really matter because it doesn't, and it doesn't really matter for me either because I can live any way that I want and it'd be still be okay. I won't end up in hell in separation from God. Like all of those things that I've been mentioning, they're, they're floating around in the church, okay? And the reason why Paul is instructing Timothy in this area is that there needs to be a fulfillment of his personal ministry, but there also needs to be a ministry of the Word in churches. And I would encourage you, if you have heard things like what I've said, these false doctrines in a church, then you'd need to get out of that church. And in fact, if there's a reason, if there's one reason to leave a church, it's that very reason that there's false doctrine being proclaimed in a church as truth, okay? The church, the leadership of a church has a responsibility to do faithful teaching of God's Word. And that's to fulfill the ministry of the church. It's an expectation that you need to have about the church you attend and our church here. So there's the personal side of it of Timothy, but then there's what God is actually saying to the church that the church needs to fulfill its ministry, and that means you and me. So let me ask you this question. How are you fulfilling your ministry to be faithful to God? 
How are you fulfilling your ministry to be faithful to God? Because that's the only way, that's the only way that we're guarding and protecting faith. All right, here's the second one, and that is this. Keep the faith. Just keep the faith. So notice as Paul continues writing to Timothy, he says, for I'm already being poured out as a drink offering, and the time of my departure has come. I have fought the good fight. I have finished the race. I have kept the faith. He is able to say that about himself. So let me give some context about why he's saying this, okay? So Paul, at this point in time, is uh, under chains and imprisonment with the Romans. He's now, he's writing this letter to Timothy in Ephesus from prison in Rome. That's where he's writing this letter from. And he writes this letter understanding that he is on his way. He is going to die And he is going in this direction. There's no turning back from where he is. At some point, he knows that he's going to die when he goes through all of the legal proceedings that have brought him to that place. Okay? So when he says, I am ready to be poured out as a drink offering, let me put that in context. Okay? In all the Old Testament sacrifices, what finished off the sacrifice was a drink offering that was given. It was the last step in the offerings. So there was sacrifice that was involved. And, and, and Paul's like, this is me. In this sacrifice of my life that I am giving for God, I am at the last stage of that. He's acknowledging that he's at the end. And then he says this, and I would challenge us that we need to live every day being able to say these phrases, I have fought the good fight. I have finished the race. And I have kept the faith. Because that's really what it means to be a Christian. I've, I've engaged in this battle of fighting faith. I, I, I've run my race. I've run the things that, and I've done the things that God has called me to do and I have been, kept everything. And that's Paul guarding, living his faith. And may they be our testimony. Now, What does this all mean for us? You see, Paul shows that his life has been a sacrifice by pointing us to this offering idea. So has your life been a sacrifice? Have you actually decided that you're going to give up or put away certain things to follow in the steps of Jesus. That's sacrificial. Maybe it has to do with money. Maybe it has to do with time. Maybe it has to do with dreams and hopes. Maybe it has to do with your future. Maybe, maybe, maybe God would ask you to do something that you're just like, I don't know that I could ever do that, God, but I will sacrifice to do what you've asked me to do. If we are going to keep the faith, there must be sacrifice. That's what Paul is saying. There's got to be sacrifice here. But the other part of it is where we are fighting the good fight of faith. And that is to stay faithful to Jesus for our entire lives. Through trials, through tribulations, through difficulties, through suffering ups and downs it's holding fast to god battling against our sin battling against our sinful nature being engaged in faith 
And I'm actually really concerned about this one. Because in our North American context, especially in the church, we don't do a lot of sacrificing anymore. And in fact, we don't do a lot of hard struggling against sin. And in fact, in many places, we're just living in our bubble of Christianity, not even engaging with the culture around us and not really trying to push against the culture going counterculturally. We need to be able to say if we're guarding our faith that we're keeping the faith. We're living sacrificially. Where there are Canadians who are being like Jim Elliott but not going to the other side of the world, but going right here in mission in Canada. People giving up their comfort to do things that God needs done in our world. Living counterculturally and being a little bit bold and straightforward about it. And just let me remind you what happened yesterday. Okay, Remembrance Day, there was, a, how do I say this, a rule, a regulation that was put in place by the Canadian military that Padres cannot pray. They cannot pray anymore at a religious, or sorry, at a Remembrance Day service. Hello? Did we hear that? Now, it's all religions at this point because it just might be offensive. It might bring trauma to veterans. This is where our culture is, okay? Somebody asked me what I would do if I was in a ceremony yesterday and they were forbidding me to pray. I said, I, that's fine. I'm going to read Scripture. <laughs> Matthew. Chapter 5, the Lord's Prayer. Uh, yeah, so I would just say, I'm reading Scripture. This is what Scripture says. And this is how the disciples went to Jesus and said, how should we pray? We're just reading Scripture, guys. You see, there must be a boldness in us in this world that we're living today where we're convinced that we're going to keep the faith. We're going to be in those places of sacrifice. We're going to be in those places where there's a struggle. And we're going to do it with boldness and we're going to do it with courage. Because that's what keeping the faith is. Because as, you know, And remember, if we're not doing this, like Paul's coming to the end of his life, he's reflecting back on his life, and he's saying, you know what? I have fought the good fight. I've been there. I've been in the struggle as I look back on my life. And I can say that I've run this race. I've kept the faith. And may each of us be able to say that. And so the question becomes, are we keeping the faith? Because it, to keep the faith is what is guarding and protecting faith in our lives and in the lives of our church, our church family. Here's the last one, and that is if we're, if we're going to be faithful, <laughs> we need to keep our eyes on the prize. Because that's really what keeps us going in terms of faithfulness. And he says this, henceforth, okay? So because he's been living like this, because he's been keeping the faith, because he's been fulfilling, because he's saying that too when he's saying that he's run the race, because I've been fulfilling my ministry, I've been keeping the faith, henceforth, because of this, what is laid up for me is the crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will award to me on that day. Hallelujah. You see, Paul is not neglect on reminding Timothy where our focus and our attention needs to be. And that is the prize. This crown of righteousness. 
Now this crown of righteousness is given to us. And again, he's using this symbol of a crown like he does in other places of a robe. With the robes of righteousness, this crown of righteousness that God has given to us through Jesus. If you have come to Jesus and you've accepted faith in Jesus, you've said, hey, I'm a sinner. My sin separates me from God. Jesus Christ died on the cross so that His blood that was shed would be shed for our sacrifice so that we would be called righteous. He who knew no sin became sin for us so that we might become the righteousness of God. Hallelujah! Okay? This crown that He's given us is what we need to remind ourselves that what this is all about. We are going in this direction because God is rewarding the faithful with this crown of righteousness. And our vision is to be on this crown of righteousness. Our vision is to be on the return of Christ. Notice, he says here, he says that the Lord will award to me on that day. The day when He returns. The day when He comes as this righteous judge to right all the things that have been wrong. To declare to His enemies that He alone is King. We've got to keep our eye on that. And it is so easily (laughs) distracted off of that by all the things that we have happening day after day, week after week. And we're to be loving this. Notice, it says, and this is, this is where Paul just includes the whole church. Because Timothy's going to read this letter that he gets from Paul to the church at Ephesus. Because this is so encouraging. It says, when the Lord, the righteous judge, will award to me on that day, and not only me, but also all who have loved His appearing. Do you love His appearing this morning? You see, if our eyes are not on this prize of His return and really loving His return, and I'm talking about heartfelt affection, redirecting your life so much because you love this moment and you're looking forward to this moment, that you are putting all of your attention on that. Your eye is on the prize. And you just can't wait. Now, this looks different for each of us, but I want to encourage you to actually have that kind of life where you talk about it. And you, and you say, you know what, I just can't wait till Jesus comes back. I just love His appearing and all the things that are going to take place at His appearing. People should know you for that. At the same time, we need to be so determined that this is going to happen that we don't turn off to the side. Because again, when we lose the focus of our intention wherein our eye is not on the prize of this robe of righteousness, this crown of righteousness, the Lord appearing, coming back, being the King of kings, the Lord of lords, overall, fully exposed, we end up not guarding faith. We end up wandering off into other areas, whether it's work or life, grandkids, the retirement plan, whatever it is that preoccupies our time. May we not take our eye off where we're going. And as Paul is wrapping up this letter, he's just reminding us that we will end up arriving at the place that we are staring at. Have you ever been driving down the road this happens to me a lot my wife could attest to this 
I spend a lot of time looking around. Oh, oh, that's kind of cool. What's happening over there? Oh, there's a new building. Oh, that's oh, I haven't been down this street in a while. Wow. And know what happens? Is every time I'm looking in a different direction than on the road, my hands naturally take the car in that direction. Okay, you know, I see lots of elbow poking here to the spouses and people smirking. You know what I'm talking about, right? Our eye needs to be in the direction. There needs to be a singleness of our eye to protect our faith, to go in this direction. So may we be doing that. May we be guarding faith together as we fulfill our ministries, as we keep the faith, and as we keep our eye on the prize of this crown of righteousness and the Lord's return. Does that, does that sound like something good to do? To be about? Yes, it does. So may we, may we all, this week as we go from here, as we live our lives out, just be faithful in this ministry of life that God has given to us. May we be faithful. Amen? Amen. Let's pray. Dear God, we thank you so much for your word that instructs us, that reminds us of the truth. Lord, I pray today as we have opened up your word and listened to you, that you would help us continue to fulfill our ministry. Lord, that we would just make a personal commitment in our own heart to be faithful in the ministry that you have called us to. And Lord, that for each of us as followers of Jesus, as we've gathered here today, be able to say, I have kept the faith. I've run the race. <sighs> Laid up for me is this crown of righteousness. Lord, may we be able to say that as Christians, as followers of Jesus. And Lord, if there, is no, if there is someone here that cannot say that about their life, I pray, Lord, that they would yield their heart to You. That they would actually be able to say those words to You and to the people around them. Lord, we don't know if this afternoon we could be in a car accident and we could die. We could have a major heart attack and be gone by the end of the week. God, I pray that no one would even leave here or even think about leaving here today without fully knowing in their own heart that they are saved by grace through Jesus. Lord, I pray that we would all give our lives over to you, put our faith and our personal trust in you. God, I thank you that you loved us so much that you gave your life on the cross so that we could spend eternity with you. And Lord, that we were made aware of this through eyewitnesses, through the power of the Holy Spirit and the fellowship that we have with the saints. So God, we give you the glory for you alone are worthy. And Lord, give us the heart that says, I have fought the good fight. I have finished the race. And I have kept the faith. And we pray all of this in the name of Jesus. Amen.